is cyberpunk today in the sense that you are all here we're all talking about cyberpunk and writing some amalgamation of cyberpunk but you know why why did you why did you make that comment but on top of that you know you made arguments throughout the essay about why cyberpunk is not dead and how we can revitalize it so what are your thoughts on that yeah, well, I think the opening of that essay is kind of mimicking what people say a lot, right? So other people mm-hmm. say that cyberpunk is dead all the time and that, yeah, yeah I was arguing uh, that it wasn't. I mean, I think that, you know, we've touched on some of this, right? That there's kind of a, a disjunction between cyberpunk is a set of kind of perhaps stale aesthetic signifiers of of neon and that kind of uh, Japan panic and, and, and all these other things we've talked about. and that does to me feel a little sterile at this point. But what I, and I think most of us here consider more like the fundamental aspects of cyberpunk, these kind of thematic questions do feel more relevant than ever. I mean, it, they almost feel so relevant that it's, it feels like cliche to even point them out, right? But we live in a world in which the big corporations are only bigger and bigger, you know, Amazon yeah. and Google. And we live in a world in which the Jeff Bezos is and the Elon Musk's and the Mark Zuckerberg's get richer and richer and control more and more of, of our lives. And these technologies become more and more, uh, you know, dangerous uh, to society, you know, the effects of social media on politics. And, you know, I'm just saying stuff that is talked about all the time, right? But how, you know, how is that stuff not cyberpunk, right? Exactly. How, how are we not living in a very cyberpunk presence? So I do, I do think the genre has a lot of you know, juice left in its cybernetic arms or whatever. I, whatever <laughs> metaphor I used to think. And that, you know, at least if we, we, you know, like, like Malka was saying, you know, there, there are points of resistance and points of um, rebellion that, that we should be in, in investing in, in, in our fictions mm. that are maybe different than what they were in the eighties, but thematically all these things are just feel only more relevant. Is sad, 100%. sadly, or, or nice for the fiction, sad for our daily existence. True, true. Well, as authors, it's uh, it's good for you. So, <laughs> Tim, what are your thoughts? Um, what was the question? <laughs> the, for the more, setting? more, more, more so about what uh, the the state of cyberpunk today and and oh, how you feel oh, how we can if, keep it revitalized. Well, I mean, look, yeah, I I. Set all of mine in Southeast Asia or, or Australia, where I where I lived, um, and I set it. The, the novels, for example, set in um, Vietnam. Now, Vietnam, Hanoi, where I was living when I wrote the novel. Visually, yes, is a very cyberpunk city. For all the things, it's this, this huge, frenetic metropolis, heavily polluted. But the interesting thing about Vietnam is. Not the interesting thing, but one of the, the, the compelling things about Vietnam is how it's just been this pawn of empires throughout, throughout its history, the pawn of a Chinese empire, of the French empire, the Japanese empire, the American empire, and then back to China again. And I think <clears throat> because of, I think cyberpunk is one means through which you can uh, discuss issues of colonialism, for example. Vietnam is also a place where individual and collective memory is often repressed. Again, cyberpunk is really good at talking about memory, memory manipulation, memory wipes. But also, I think this happens less often, but I think there's some interesting um, stories and novels um, to be had on the way collective memory can be manipulated. Um, Although that, of course, goes back to 1984. Uh, so I, I think that for me, <clears throat> cyberpunk, if you're looking at, if say if we are going into a Chinese uh, century, as many are saying, and that's not an unreasonable claim, I, geez, I think cyberpunk is really a fa- uh, one of the best subgenres to add to, to, to explore that what if, what if America breaks up and China is the sole, sole superpower? What next? And then if you want to talk about a surveillance state and social credit schemes and uh, neocolonialism, wow, cyberpunk has got all the the instruments you need uh, and all the um, intellectual uh, tools you need to explore that, I think. Yeah, I agree. 
And Craig, what are your thoughts on, on cyberpunk today and, and how you feel in terms of where it's come from to what Tim and, and Lincoln said about more contemporary issues that it can tackle? Yeah, I, th- I agree with Tim because I think if if you look at 80s cyberpunk and you know it was the fear of Japan becoming this global superpower that was going to steamroll over the world with its technology and its cultures, as Tim says, you could quite easily forecast that potentially happen with China and you know this social credit system. If that was rolled out on a global scale, what would that mean? And yeah, I totally agree. I think cyberpunk is the perfect medium to explore the horror, the potential horror of what that would mean for society and how that technology could be used and no, not used. I think that's that's a good thing that cyberpunk is good at looking at is how can how technology is abused to kind of maintain this elitism between the haves yeah. and the have-nots, really. I mean, um, I should add that I think that, uh, sorry to interrupt, Craig, but that Oh, no, for we're it. also we're also very much talking about the present, you know. We're talking. It's not. We're not being predictive. We're being descriptive, and mm-hmm. and we we might extrapolate. We might take the DNA of the present and put it out in the future, but so much of what I'm talking about, if I said it a hundred years from now, it's happening right now. You know, 